These are humpback whales, given their name by early whalers who observed the curious arching of their backs when diving. Beneath the then impenetrable veil of the sea, early whalers could not guess at the humpback's beauty and fluid grace, or imagine the awesome display of its long white flippers. Perennial voyages, the humpbacks migrate seasonally from polar seas to tropical waters and back again, singing as they travel. Captain Cousteau and the divers of Calypso will seek out and follow the white-winged humpbacks through their underwater highways and attempt to analyze their amazing repertoire of melodic sounds, which bioacoustic experts call songs. And it is hoped that when man and whale meet underwater, some understanding may be reached with these loquacious representatives of the greatest of living creatures. In recent years, the plaintive song of the humpback whale has become a dirge to a disappearing species. For whaling, frail boats and hand harpoons have long been replaced by 700-ton catcher ships and harpoon cannons fitted with grenades. Whales must eventually surface to refill their great lungs. For hunted whales, air breathing is their fatal flaw. The whale corpses are inflated with compressed air to keep them afloat on their way to factory ships, where an 80-ton whale can be processed in 30 minutes. Giants of the sea, slaughtered for such as suntan oil and lipstick, soap and margarine, pet food and fertilizer. To seek out humpback whales, survivors of years of overhunting, Captain Cousteau arrives in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. Whale hunting is prohibited here. The United States has forbidden whaling in its territorial waters, as well as the importing of any whale products, all of which can now be obtained from other sources. The International Whaling Commission has added the humpback to its moratorium list to avoid its extinction. The irony is that some members simply disregard recommendations of the Commission. From man, these whales have known only spears and harpoons. How can we let them know that we approach them as friends?
The Jeanette has been commissioned as a dive boat to comb the Caribbean Sea for humpback whales. Philippe Cousteau will be in radio contact with Captain Cousteau, who will attempt to sight the whales from the air and direct the divers to their vicinity. Local fishermen have signaled us by radio the areas where they have sighted whales. The humpback is unpredictable and often does not show up where seen on previous migrations. We have planned our expedition for the time of peak migration to these waters, mid-February. The whales are most likely to be found in the channels between the islands, where they funnel through in their northbound migrations. As I rendezvous with Jeannette, Philippe and Raymond Coll optimistically dress to die. After searching for nearly a month, it is not easy to remain optimistic. At last, a spouting humpback. It is a solitary male. Males are forerunners of the migration. It's a call all hands, and the Zodiac is hauled in to assist in the chase. The whale swims just below the surface, but is visible to Cousteau and the helicopter hovering above. Cousteau radio directs the Jeanette and gives hand signals to the crew. Francois Dorado and Raymond Cole transfer to the Zodiac as the mighty breath of the whales cuts across the sea. 50 feet long and fully 50 tons, the whale levels out and flies, swept winged, like a jumbo jet underwater. In full scuba gear and at full speed, Raymond bails out over the whale. Obviously, a diver is too slow to pursue a whale. The best he can do is to intercept it for a short time. Philippe may be able to film the swift leviathan if the whale's flight can be confined between the Jeanette and the Zodiac. Powered by its great tail, the humpback whale can attain speeds up to 12 knots. It is a supreme challenge to photograph him underwater. On the bow of the speeding boat, Philippe must seize the exact moment to contact a whale. Using its long wings for a sharp turn, the whale banks away from Philippe, who is somewhere under the blanket of foam.
Our artful dodger makes a U-turn beneath us and leaves Philippe stranded like a speck of bobbing flotsam. <laughs> From the air, I observe how futile are the efforts of our divers to stay with the whale. But I have a grandstand seat. Whalers used to identify whale species by the shape of the spout. The handbag spout, sometimes 15 feet high, spreads like a fountain. The Zodiac picks up Raymond and Philippe. They had no chance to use their underwater cameras, so elusive has been the whale. By holding its breath, the whale can stay down 20 minutes or more before surfacing again. The humpback, the most playful of whales, has outsmarted our divers. By old English law, the whale is declared a royal fish. Fish it is not. Royalty of the sea it may well be. Its underflukes seem trimmed with ermine. Its noble flippers, one third the length of its body, are also graced by sleeves of royal ermine white. Our frolicsome whale appears to enjoy the wash of our helicopter's blades. The whale rolls over to take a long look at us and bids us fond adieu. Cousteau hastens to land on a coral outcropping before the whale can get too far away. Cousteau hurries to join his crew on the Jeannette before the whale swims out of recording range. Although denied the opportunity to film the whale underwater, it is hoped they will now be successful in an attempt to enter the singing whale's world of sound. So as to avoid boat noises, a hydrophone suspended beneath a flotation buoy is paid out. The call of the lonely whale is plaintive, often melodious. Suddenly, there is a distant voice. Perhaps it is a female answering a courtship call. At night, Armand Davso lowers a hydrophone off a silent sailboat specially chartered for recording. We learn that handbags are more talkative during the night. As we spy on their domain, we are like wiretappers. We have the technical equipment, but do not know how to decode the language, if that it be. Once, superstitious sailors of old lay trembling in their bunks as these ghostly moans reverberated through the wooden hulls of their boats. We too listen in wonderment to the songs of the unseen nomads of the deep. In their attempt to contact singing whales, the Cousteau party has moved from the unproductive waters of the Virgin Islands to Bermuda, 600 miles east of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. 
the scarce humpbacks reportedly stop off at this port of call to feed and rest on their return migration to polar seas. The ocean remains discouragingly empty. Finally, a jumping whale. The terrific splash has revealed the presence of a group of humpbacks. Philippe and Bernard dress quietly, knowing that the whales will remain here for several days before continuing northward. Our divers will try to get as close as possible to the whales in a slow and quiet approach. the infiltration seems to go unnoticed. Philippe signals Bernard to flank the whales. Our first film of the handbag underwater is of the animals in flight. To sound straight down, a whale raises its enormous flukes. Sumion is caught in the center of the milling whales. A slap of a tail could send him and the zodiac skyward, but there is no animosity. There is only underwater flight. And Bernard is unable to turn the whales back toward Philippe's camera. The whales may have been frightened by the sound of the bubbles from our air tanks. Cetaceans have no visible outer ears, but have middle and internal ears, highly sensitive to underwater sounds. And for Philippe, the disappointment of filming only the tales of fleeing phantoms. Philippe once more finds consolation in listening to the calls of the whales reverberating through a canyon below. The ocean sound corridors give the whale's voice enormous range. The tape recordings by Eugène Lagorio display a great variety of melodious sounds that may be called songs. For expert analysis of the humpback whale's phonations, Captain Cousteau has brought the tapes recorded off the Virgin Islands and Bermuda to Dr. William C. Cummings, head of applied bioacoustics at the Naval Undersea Center in San Diego, California. We brought to you these uh, recordings because uh, we wished them to be analyzed and in order to understand better what these songs really mean. Uh, did you already make the analysis? Yes, in fact, uh, we've just finished the analysis up here now. Take this. That's a frequency analyzer. 
Yes, it's frequency versus time. Yeah. And it gives a portrayal. What's the range of frequency? We run here in this particular sound from 44 uh, cycles per second to 2200 cycles per second, more or less accompanying the human capability. Mm -hmm. What we have here is a spectrogram which portrays uh, the sound, a typical sound, of the humpback whale. In this direction of the display is uh, frequency, or pitch, if you will. And uh, here we have time. We end up with these black marks whose intensity signifies those areas where most of the sound energy is. Here is the beginning of the sound, and here is the end of the sound. And you see the sweeping down uh, as we hear it on the tape. You have that sound on your machine, don't you? Yes, it is right. Let's here. listen to it. Do we have any idea of how they make these sounds? Do they use their blowholes? In some cases, when the whale is at the surface of the water and it expires the air or blows, water is trapped in this depression and it lends characteristics to sound. There is a possibility, a very strong possibility, that they can use their larynx. They do have a perfectly good voice box, a larynx, but no vocal cords as we know them from our experience with other animals. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, these signals cannot be heard very, very far away suggests that the songs are linked with the whales behavior in groups. Do we have any evidence of that? Do you think that each one of these songs is related to a specific type of behavior? Uh, we don't have any experimental evidence for it. However, we know that the animal would not have evolved such a complex mechanism and such a complex repertoire of sounds without any particular meaning. The recordings we made include some low frequency noises, really grunts, but uh, most of them uh, are songs, really, uh, melodious songs. Um, how would you characterize a really, song? Is there, a, is there a pattern that would allow us to name them songs? Generally speaking, a song is a repetitive sequence of acoustical energy, uh, such as the song of man or the song of a bird, uh, wherein there is some melody and some uh, metric qualities. Uh, this is properly applied to the case of the humpback whale, uh, the uh, beautiful songs. Uh, in this particular case, they repeat themselves at uh, intervals, long intervals. Each song is uh, some uh, 9 to 18 minutes in length, which is extraordinary in comparison to other animals. And humans, uh, let's take a spectacular example. For example, a well-known singer like Barbara Streisand. Oh, well, I'd much prefer listening to Barbara Streisand. However, Barbara Streisand cannot measure up either in this case. She cannot measure up with a humpback whale? No. She doesn't <laughs> sing for 18 minutes, for example. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the humpback whale does. The song of the humpback whale can continue up to 18 minutes and be repeated over again. Moreover, Barbara Streisand cannot reach the very low pitch, and, and, uh, nor can she match the power of the humpback whale. At the Calypso team's island headquarters in the Bermudas, the singing humpback whales entertain in concert. In command performance, the great whales sing solo. They harmonize in answering duets. They boom forth in full chorus. The impressive repertoire of the singing whales whets our appetite for personal contact, but we have yet to establish any rapprochement with these carousos of the sea.
Off Bermuda, the rough seas of February add to the adventure of approaching and filming humpback whales. Humpbacks leap as part of their mating ritual, but often it is simply an expression of their frolicsome nature. With Sumian as pickup man, this time Bernard and Philippe will swim with snorkels alone to approach the whales. They hope that unencumbered by tanks, they may more easily intercept the whales. Having eliminated the drag of air tanks and the frightening bubbles, Bernard and Philippe swim strongly, but still the whales flee. The men pursue as fast as they can, hardly half the speed of the whale. We have no way of knowing if the fun-loving whales consider our divers a challenge or merely too insignificant to warrant their interest. veer away from our exhausted divers, who seem to have met their match. The giants swim away. Still beyond us are these mighty monarchs of the sea. The fast running following sea brings Philippe and Bernard to the rail of their wave tossed dive boat. No film has been exposed. Not only the whales, but the battering rough sea has defeated them. Our diver's disappointment is fittingly expressed in the old sailing song. Roll on, thou deep and dark blue ocean, roll. Ten thousand mariners sweep over thee in vain. Chaque fois qu'on a essayé de les approcher, euh, on a employé des techniques douces, gentilles. On a été très lentement, très doucement vers les baleines. At their quarters on Bermuda Island. The Calypso team plots how they might yet contact the humpback singing whales in the vastness of the open sea. It is to be a final attempt before the whales continue their northward trek and disperse throughout the polar seas. In a game of cetacean chess, Bernard positions his lighter to represent the zodiac, his tobacco pouch the pursuit craft curlew, and his spoon, a baleen humpback whale. Quand on a aperçu les baleines, on embarque dans le zodiaque avec toi, Dominique, et tu nous amènes à bonne distance les baleines. Au moment où elles veulent respirer, tu fonces dessus et tu te maintiens à leur, à leur hauteur. Elles vont être surprises, elles vont respirer très peu hein, et elles vont essayer de venir respirer une seconde fois. The whales can dive over a thousand feet, too deep for the men to follow. When whales are sighted, the skipper of the curlew, Philippe Sirot, will close in quickly. The Zodiac, piloted by Sumian, will rush at the whales before they have time to inhale enough air to dive very deep. Startled, the whales will have to take short breaths and remain near the surface for filming. The Curlew and the Zodiac will then attempt to corral the whales and turn them toward Philippe's underwater camera. We are aware that the whale is quick to counter even the best of plans. From the time of Jonah to Aristotle to the present, man has concocted fables about these phenomenal beings because of the absence of facts. There is nothing about a whale, no reaction, no flick of a flipper, 
no stroke of the tail that man has been able to interpret with certainty. From the flying bridge, once more the sea is searched for spouters. Off the starboard bow, a great whale shows his tail and steeply dives. Our past inability to observe these titans underwater has somewhat deflated our confidence. Once a whale has sounded, one has no way of guessing where it will surface again. Philippe dresses with the red lining of his wetsuit turned out so he cannot be mistaken for a killer whale. Every precaution is taken against causing the flight of the Leviathans. In the Zodiac, Sumion is ready to play his strategic role in this tournament with whales. It is the sea of giants we are entering, an arena proportionate to the whale's size and strength, not ours. Off the bow of the curlew, a great whale tests the plan for encirclement. Sumian discovers that what appeared to be one whale is actually two, a female and her calf. Sumian pursues the mother and baby. The zodiac is made of rubber and cannot harm them. In his attempt to corral the two whales and keep them within underwater camera range, Sumian rides the Zodiac as he would a cow pony on a short rein. Sumian signals Bernard and Philippe to get ready to enter the water. The whales are now swimming within the ring created by the Zodiac. After weeks of disappointment, their greatest opportunity is at hand. The whales seem to be settling down. They appear to tolerate the zodiac like an insignificant, if bothersome, fly. Then the adult runs into Bernard. As Sumian approaches once more, the mother whale lifts her head above the water to look at him and dives. Our divers will have an unobscured window to the whales if they can be approached. As Bernard swims toward the animals to help turn them toward Philippe's camera, the stunning impact of both sight and sound of humpback whales. Bernard and Philippe follow the female and her calf, and Philippe films the mother helping her baby to the surface to breathe. The buzzing of the zodiac has a hypnotic effect upon the whales.
Bernard and Philippe have trouble keeping pace, even though the powerful female is swimming slowly, unwilling to leave her baby behind. To touch a passing whale is to take a first step toward communication. Adult whales have protective blubber a foot thick and cannot be injured by the rubber zodiac. Even so, Sumian carefully lifts the propeller guard so that it does not scrape her. Gently, the mother whale lifts her great flipper to avoid hurting the stranger. But the turbulence created by her powerful tail sends Philip tumbling. The mother seems to be quietly eyeing us while shielding her frisky calf. Because of their colossal size, large whales have in the past been studied mainly as carcasses. Here in the wilderness, we meet at last in all their awesome beauty, the living whales. Each of the knobs on the whale's upper jaw contains a single hair, perhaps dating back to when whales were land mammals. To see our divers better, the whales use their great flippers to turn sideways. Their eyes are far back on the sides of their heads, which reduces their field of vision directly in front of them. They probably rely less on sight than sound. The mother, who has been supplying her calf with rich milk since her baby was born, seems to have grown thin. These waters are not as plentiful in plankton as northern waters. Mother whales remain in warm climates until their babies grow in size and strength before making the arduous return to polar seas. Encouraged by the gentleness of the whale, 
Bernard dares a ride on her flipper and gets a lesson in hydrodynamics. The baby moves closer to its mother for comfort and reassurance. They surface to breathe as one. Sumi encircles the whale, which packs 500 horsepower in her tail. She turns under the Zodiac, and quickly Sumian raises the engine. The whale could have knocked the Zodiac out of the water, but did not. This power, so sure of itself, has little to do with the fictional ferocity of a Moby Dick. During our brief encounter, the whales have repeatedly gone out of their way to avoid harming our divers. Huge animals have displayed an incredible gentleness toward us. We have been able to approach the singing whales only through their tolerance and their curiosity. For as Philip observes, they could have escaped or killed us many times. Bernard has a last fling with the mother and her calf before they depart. We leave the water having met eye to eye the greatest of living creatures. We wonder what image they have gained of us and if they think well of us. The men ascend the dive platform. Theirs has been an extraordinary experience. And now the men, each in his own way, savor the moments their lives touched moving mountains, become companions in the sea. Captain Cousteau and the divers of Calypso rendezvous at sea. They observe that the other whales are waiting on the perimeter for the mother and calf to join them before continuing their migration. We took into the sea and met playful, easygoing giants. For a few moments, there was a breakthrough in communication between whales and men. Perhaps someday we will be able to link their songs with behavior and grow closer to our ever-traveling, ever-singing big brothers in the sea. Following the migrating whales, Calypso travels to frigid polar waters. The small whale herds disband here. Only mothers and calves remain inseparably together in these polar seas. Philippe and Captain Cousteau search the empty horizon for telltale spouts. A young female is sighted across the bow of Calypso. 
La baleine, par le travers de la calypso. Ouais. Well, a cross calypso. A Calypso-based helicopter is employed to help locate the scattered whales. Ça y est, on en survole une maintenant. Helicopter, helicopter, did you get the whale? Ça y est, on filme. The female is photographed and then it disappears. Rendez-vous, rendez-vous. In warm seas, where humpback whales mate and rear their young. The protection officially extended to them as an endangered species is respected. But in both the Arctic and the Antarctic, far from embarrassing witnesses, unchecked whalers continue to kill them. Soon there may be too few singing whales to find each other and to reproduce in sufficient number to overcome their death rate. What a sad song would be that of the last whale beneath the sea, singing for a mate when there is not another whale to hear. Let us all rally to the call. Let us see that the song is answered in expanding numbers and that for many years to come, the songs of the whales be heard throughout the sea. <laughs>